You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books. This week, I am asking for help from you, my loyal listeners. To continue to grow this podcast, I need to have a larger presence on Apple Podcast. So I'm requesting that anyone who listens on that platform or even has access to it to kindly leave me a review or even just a rating to help boost the podcast on the Apple platform. I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. As with many things these days, ratings seem to help more than anything else. Today, I am interviewing Stephen Kiernan. As a journalist and novelist, Stephen has published nearly 4 million words. His newspaper work garnered more than 40 awards, including the George Polk Award and the Scripps Howard Award for Distinguished Service to the First Amendment. Stephen's latest novel is Universe of Two. I thoroughly enjoyed interviewing him, and I hope you enjoy it. I chose his book as one of my Buzz Reads picks for August, and I think it's just a fabulous read. Welcome, Stephen. I'm so glad you are here to join me to talk about your latest book, Universe of Two. How are you today? I'm doing great and eager to talk about it. So tell me about it. Let's get started with just telling me about the basic plot. Sure. It's the elevator pitch. Uh, This is a love story set in 1944 amid the development of the atomic bomb primary male character is a young mathematician, 19 years old, who is, instead of being drafted into the army, is inducted into the Manhattan Project without really knowing what he's getting involved in, and then seeing how incredibly serious the work is, and having moral qualms about what he's required to do. The main female character is Brenda. She is a talented keyboard player, organ and piano, and she's working in the family organ store in Chicago, and their paths cross, and she's kind of a sassy Chicago gal, and she's not allowed to know what he's doing for security reasons. And so whenever he has qualms, she just dismisses them and says, be a soldier, be a man. And then when the bomb works, when it does what it's supposed to do, Charlie, the main, the male protagonist, really feels a weight of guilt about his role in this. And, and Brenda likewise feels some culpability for really pushing him to do something he was reluctant to do. And so together they set out to spend the rest of their lives uh, looking for redemption and atonement, and they find it. And the love story is how they find it together. Well, I was fascinated by the concept that he didn't even know what he was working on. I've read about the Manhattan Project and understood that that was kept under wraps and no one knew what was happening in Los Alamos, but I didn't realize that not even some of the people working on it knew what was happening. That was a totally new detail to me. It was a fascinating thing in the research part of this, and we can, we can talk more about that, but a lot of spouses of the scientists after the war wrote memoirs that they self-published, and they were really, really helpful from a research standpoint. And what would happen is somebody who was a world-famous chemist would show up at a major university to, to speak with a particularly gifted or talented or experienced chemist, and he'd say, we want you to be part of the war effort, and you're going to go to the West in the Southwest, and we don't know how long it'll be for. And the, and the family would pack up, and literally they wouldn't know what town it was, what his job was going to be. And um, the spouses would just go along. And, and then typically those, those scientists who were being recruited would grab all the grad students they could find to be their tech staff in the labs. The result is that the average age of the people at Los Alamos was 27. And they called Robin Opp- Robert Oppenheimer, who was the director of the whole Manhattan Project, they called him the old man, and he was 39. Oh, I did not realize that. That is so, so the, yeah, funny. Yeah, the culture there was much younger, and they, were all sort, they all sort of um, eventually realized what they were working on, and some were more enthusiastic than others. I thought you portrayed that very well, actually, um, that some people were fine and on board with it, and others obviously had you know, moral compunction, were curious, weren't sure what they were doing was right. The yeah. other thing that I actually loved was your descriptions of Los Alamos and getting there and how hard it was to get there and what it was like there. I thought you brought all of that to life. I mean, I felt like I was there with them on the bumpy road and at night when they were listening to music. I, I just thought that was all fabulous. Well, thank you. You know, um, for the research in this, of course, I went there. But first, I'd read all these 1940s accounts, and it was like going to the end of the earth in a lot of ways. And it really is. I remember many years ago, 20, 25, 30 years ago, there was a 
picture in, uh, on the cover of National Geographic of a monastery at the top of this peak with a, with a rainbow shining into it. Kind of a famous image. And, and Los Alamos is a little bit like that. I mean, it really is way up on this promontory of rock. And, you know, if you want to make a place uh, a fortress, it is that kind of setting, very much a part. And it was really rough roads to get there. It was not kind of a fancy situation at all. The labs were the priority, not the living conditions. Um, you know, the single men like Charlie and my character, they lived in barracks and they were just sardined into there. And um, some of that, the, the, the fun part, I mean, you know, when you do your research, you, you're learning a lot of facts. But really, what, what I'm always sniffing around for is the human component. Like, what's it like for this dormitory, this barracks of young men, you know, between the ages of maybe 20 and 25, have 90 of them packed into a space that holds 60 with not a wall between them and no privacy? And what's it like for them then to be working together I mean, with all the different points of view that people have about the bomb and that we still have today? And this book is not a polemic. It's not an anti nuke book or pro nuke it's simply saying these are all the different perspectives that people had and how they acted on them and then this one lovable mathematician charlie fish who turns out has kind of an important job and and didn't even know that that's what he was going for so that was going to be my next question how did you stumble upon charlie's story and decide to write this book i am an omnivore when it comes to reading. And one of the things that I read is literary quarterlies. And I'm always amazed at how few people subscribe to these excellent publications. And at any rate, so I've been getting the Georgia Review for decades. And there was an essay in there about a man from Massachusetts who was on the detonator team for the Manhattan Project. And after the war, he felt a lot of guilt about what he had done. And so he did some very interesting things with a later part of his life that I don't want to say because it's a spoiler for my novel, but I, I started out thinking, I'm gonna write a book about this guy. And it turns out he has a biographer. You know, I met with his daughter. I got what, it, what limited information the, the, the officialdom from the Department of Energy would give me about him. And I realized that, that he was, a, you know, as a human being, he was really more complex than I needed a fictional character. But I took the basics of his life and said, so that's a starting point, perhaps, for a novel that somebody would have misgivings about building the bomb. And then when I did my research, I found tons and tons of people who had misgivings and petitions that were written by Nobel Prize winners that hundreds of scientists would sign saying, we should not build the bomb. Or more often, we should not use it on human beings. We should demonstrate it somewhere and Japan will surrender and so on. There are people who resigned on principle once they realized they were doing all that sort of dissent. And I think that that part of story has been lost from the history we know about Oppenheimer. We know about how the bomb worked. We know there was this kind of fortress where the, the science went on. But I think that the story of people's misgivings has been lost. And, you know, part of what novels do sometimes is have characters figure something out and make moral decisions that will affect them and the world around them. And so this was very compelling to me. Started me on, you know, now if, if you want me to come over and build an atomic bomb in your garage, like the ingredients are expensive, it's not a hard recipe. <laughs> <laughs> well, that part was interesting too to me, the detonator part of it, how it would detonate up in the, all of that was fascinating to me. And I thought you described all of that very well okay. too. So it wasn't something I had thought through. I knew a little bit about the descent, you know, and the people would have had misgivings afterwards, but I thought it was fascinating that some of them didn't know what they were doing for a while. And that would have made it even worse. You know, you went in with blinders almost. And then midway through, you're there, you've been working on this. It's probably not easy to leave. And then you have to decide what you're going to do. But I thought the petition was interesting. You wrote about that. All of that was fascinating. I thought you did a great job of, of covering all different Thank aspects you. of it. I mean, I learned so many cool things. You know, the first chain reaction ever was in a squash court underneath the football stadium at the University of Chicago. And, you know, they had a little bit of graphite around it to control the, the Geiger counters going <laughs> off the roof, but they had no idea. They're standing in the squash court doing this, above the squash. So, right. um, yeah, there was, there was a lot of rich... Uh, human detail in there. 
And here's this young couple. I mean, this book is fundamentally a love story. You know, the picture on the cover is the two people embracing. How do you withstand something like this? How's a, a relationship? I mean, all relationships, I would argue, romantic relationships were challenged by World War II, right? Lots of guys went off to war in one form or another. And so they are not unique in this way, but the order of magnitude is immense. The, the best pilots, the best fighter pilot in World War II didn't have 200 planes to be shot down. You know, the best soldier would take out a couple of machine gun nests, but he killed 100 people in, uh, in his career. But to design a device that kills hundreds of thousands of people is a whole different kind of experience and, and thing to work through after the war. And it's not just the the deaths. I mean, it also damaged so much and left people maimed. And the, the effects of it are far greater even than the horrible amount of death. There's so much else resulting from it too. Yes, and there's and there's also the probably million lives that weren't lost in combat as a result of it. And there was the perversely the incredible deterrent power of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Here we are, seventy five years later, and we've got. 10 countries that have atomic weapons and and one has never been used on people again that's that's a powerful deterrent too so you know there's a lot of moral ambiguity in there and i don't want to write a book that comes down really solidly on one side or the other i want the characters to wrestle with those ambiguities just like human beings wrestle with those decisions in their own lives. Well, and I definitely feel like you balanced it. And, you know, talking about once Germany had surrendered and Hitler had committed suicide, they thought, oh, we're all set. And then Japan was not going to give up. So no, definitely. I mean, it would, there is a lot of ambiguity in what would have happened had they not used it. I certainly agree with that. It was just, it would be hard if you'd been one of those people working on it to kind of, no of figure out where you would long term, how you would deal with that. And so for me, like the, the, in some ways, the, the salvation of this story of these characters is that they do find redemption and um, it, it is, is, is waved in front of the reader from literally the first page. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, so, so it's, it's a, it should come as a surprise and yet also have that weight of, of course, that's what they did and how beautiful. Yes, definitely. How beautiful. I completely agree. I was curious because you changed his name just a tiny bit for writing your story. Was there a reason that you did that? Yes, he's a fictionalized character. I mean, the Charlie Fish of the novel is is completely made up. As I say, I, I, I met with his biographer. I read uh, stuff, the research about him. The Department of Energy was very tight-lipped about his actual experience there, but they confirmed the works on the detonator team. Stanford University had some information. I, I interviewed his daughter, and I really felt like, no, I don't, I, I don't want to really build this story around the actual human being. I was looking for the kind of reality that exists in a work of fiction. So as simple as that. I remember, you know, I worked in newspapers for a lot of years, and the example I always give is for a while in my state, the lieutenant governor was a really boring public speaker. Nice guy, but he's a terrible public speaker. Well, as a reporter, guess what? If you had a news conference, you got to go cover it, okay? But if you're writing a novel and lieutenant governor is, is boring, you cut him out of the book. Yeah, right? or make him more fun. <laughs> exactly, or you make his boringness hilarious, right? Right, right. So there's ways that you doctor that. And so changing, changing Charlie's last name was just indicative that I changed a ton about him, that it was more just the idea of a guy on the detonator team who didn't want to be there. Uh, that's that's sort of, that was just sort of my starting point. Got it. I figured that was it, but I was just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, was there something that surprised you a lot when you wrote this? There were a lot of things that surprised me. As I mentioned, the the scientists who were undecided surprised me. I looked at a lot of old newsreels, and we forget how little information people received in that time. We are barraged with information all day long. You, you can watch a hearing in Congress live. And that was really not so. For many people, like the morning newspaper and a newsreel before the movies, that was that was very different than I expected. I think people are still people. We're still humans whenever, whatever era it is, but sexual mores change very much from generation to generation. And some of that is true in this book and evidenced in this book. And uh, And I will tell you, the thing that really surprised me is that I had never, just as a citizen, I had never dwelt on how monumentally powerful an atomic bomb is. 
and you take a detonator assembly that weighs about as much as a case of beer. And within that, there's uh, plutonium that weighs as much, much as about $1.50 in quarters. And if you do the right things in the right way, it has the explosive power of 18,500 tons of TNT. It's so, so, so powerful. And they didn't know. There were two other little cultural things that I found, if I may. One is that they're just like how research concentrates when you're looking for things in fiction. The first is Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project, probably the greatest collection of scientific minds ever in one place in human history, ever, to this day. And yet, the milk was always sour. <laughs> no, I thought that was it so could, funny. I was right? like, they can't like, have good milk. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, it came up in all these memoirs that I read that the so milk was funny. like the refrigeration was so primitive and that they had power failures and water failures and stuff like that. And I thought, that is so ironic. That just tells me so much about this place, that there's a way it was almost like camp quality mm -hmm. living conditions. Right. Yeah, except, definitely. You know, and the other was that the, there, there was an animosity between the military folk and the scientific folk. Right, because the people in the military had uniforms, rank, duty, hours they were on and off duty, mission to you know keep any intruders out, but also to prevent spying inside. And meanwhile, the scientists were these unkempt, unwashed, unshaved, <laughs> wandering around, muttering to themselves, kind of weirdos who sometimes slept under their desks because they didn't want to interrupt their work. And it turned out the military folks, in some of the accounts I read, had a kind of contempt for the scientists they looked down on them and the scientists were completely clueless about this and then of course when the trinity test occurred and some of the military guys saw what was going on they were suitably impressed and that but those little cultural things really help a lot to give a flavor of a place when you're trying to create it in the reader's imagination well, and I was fascinated by the testing and the mattresses, and they kept having to add more mattresses, I guess, to support the oh, gadget, yes. all of that. I mean, it was just fascinating. I thought, I am so glad I was not there when that was happening. <laughs> yes, um, if, if I can tell your readers what that is, is, when the, is that they wanted to detonate the first the test bomb up on a 100-foot-tall tower, and they had not built it for something as heavy as the device was, so they put all these mattresses. They got all the mattresses they could find from the, med, from the military installation and piled them up under this thing so that if it <laughs> fell, it would land on the mattresses. <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's the craziest thing. And it that's was. real. That's from history. That's absolutely from history, the pile of mattresses. That, that was just somewhat horrifying <laughs> to me. As I, was there, I was like, oh, my gosh. But, you know, and that they called it the gadget. I thought that was yes. interesting. Yes. You know, I mean, almost about, makes it less, I don't know what the right word is, but but to kind of like a pseudonym in a way to hide what they were doing. Do you think that was the point of that? To hide it from themselves almost. I think gadget yeah. back then is like widget is to us now. It means this generic noun. And it was one of the first, it was one of the only concessions actually that Oppenheimer made was let's not call it a bomb. We're building a gadget. No one was fooled, but that was the name for it. And, and that name lasted till Nagasaki. And it's just sort of interesting that, you know, well, what I'm doing is the exterior shell of a gadget, not I'm looking at a containment detonation device for an atomic bomb. It's a way that people could do their work. Yeah, shield uh, themselves. Think, yeah. yeah. I just thought that was interesting as it, when I was thinking about it during the test and some of those times that the gadget was a very interesting word to not make it sound so horrible or not horrible, but just as like it's a bomb, I guess, is the best yeah. way to say that. You know, um, I think I think it's not an overstatement to say that many of these people were afraid, afraid young men. You well, they were so was, young. Right. So what are you working on now? Uh, I am working on um, I am working on a novel about three guys who are uh, flying in a single engine plane over Canadian wilderness and they have an oil leak. And so they have to set down on a frozen lake. It's the last week in January and they are walking through Canadian wilderness. Uh, to the uh, U.S. border, hoping that there they'll find some immigration people, the, the uh, officials, and that this is how they'll survive. It is very much a survival story, but the fun of it is that there is a tracker who is looking for them as well, and it is snowing like crazy, so they're not leaving any tracks. And this tracker is uh, very intuitive, but also knows that these kind of trees grow in this kind of rock and these kind of critters running in this pattern reveal this about where the people, all that sort of stuff. She's very wise and it's a woman. And it's a woman. And so I'm really having fun playing with 
expectations we have about what a tracker is like. And meanwhile, it is a survival story, and it's very, very cold in this novel. Um, is it present day? It is about four years ago, okay. five years ago. Okay. Uh, part of it is I want to be pre-pandemic because that creates all yeah. kinds of yeah. narrative challenges, and I need I need certain kind of relationships between Canada and the United States to be at a certain level, so there's a degree of border protection, but it's not as heavily armed as I mean, right now the border's closed. Right. Um, I, live, I live not far from the Canadian border, and so I go to Canada often, and so it's, it's a great plot device to have the border and to have these young men trying to make it. And my penultimate scene occurs in the middle of a frozen lake uh, that exists, that is real, two-thirds of which is in Canada and one-third of which is in Vermont. That storyline's good right now, too, with where we are and being shut down. It'd be easy for you. I mean, you can get over to wherever you need to go versus if you were trying to set something in Europe right now, there's no way you're traveling to Europe to do your research. So that's nice right. that that worked out. I also think this story is much simpler than the last three novels I've written, which were all in some fashion about World War II. And what it really allows is for more of an allegory. Are we all not in the woods right now, <laughs> just trying to get to a place that is warm and safe? And and uh, I don't mean to be overly reductive, but really that's the kind of thrust. And there's a political element to these guys who are missing and political issues about finding them. And some of that's to raise the stakes and some of it is to say that exactly this. This, this, is a, this is a common human predicament. We don't have to be in a plane that went down and uh, um, having survived the crash landing and the snow to be lost in the woods. And I can't I wait to read that. That sounds uh, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. January of 22 is the target for that. So I've got a little while to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and talking about the pandemic, you, Universe of Two had a little bit of a different path toward publishing with coronavirus hitting when it did. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So I guess there are a couple of components to it. One is that, that I, unlike I think a lot of uh, writers, I love, 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 love touring. I love being among readers, among bookstores, bookstore owners and their integrity and their commitment to ideas. You know, I always call it the tunnel of a thousand hugs. You know, there's oh, only, like there are people that, especially through social media, readers contacting and so on. It's really lovely. And I'm okay with the solitude that writing novels requires. A couple thousand hours for every book that you just got to spend alone. But for me, a lot of the reward is then getting to be with people and tell them about the story and funny things that happen along the way and the research and the milk being sour and that kind of thing. So I had a 28 event tour planned wow. and uh, it was and it was lovely. It was great. It was going to be all virtually all among friends that I've been to bookstores a half a dozen times kind of things. Really going to be great. And a couple of large events and some festivals, and and you know, and that was going to be the first week in May, and of course, third week in March, all of that went away. And about two weeks later, my editor called, and I was hearing about books that were being canceled and so on. So when she called at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, I was not delighted to see it was her. <laughs> and she said, "What if we put this thing back a little bit?" And and I thought, oh, that'd be great. I'm sure by August I'll be able to tour, no problem. Yes. <laughs> um, so so um so we so we canceled all the events and we pushed the book back and uh, it makes me now like I'm just dying. This book was I should just say this book was very very difficult to write. It took me twice as long as the longest book I've written before. It's my sixth one. It took me twice as long, and I think it's reaching for something more. And I thought, I feel like I'm taking more risks at any rate. So so now with this delay, I'm just dying for it to be out among people. And it turns out the date that we moved it to is two days before the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima. And, you know, three days later, Nagasaki. And so there's a way in which it became more timely with that delay. There were national organizations that were planning a lot of protests around the 75th anniversary of the bomb this summer. But, of course, all of those have been scrapped. So I don't know if people have the bandwidth on it. That's why I feel like it's important to emphasize that the, the core of this story is a love story, the core of this novel. And, and yes, the bomb is there, and it's a lot of the moral consequence that these people deal with, but it is really about their relationship. So, so uh, now I'm glad that we're not brand new to Zoom. We're not brand new to some yeah. of these tools. And I'm still going to be delighted to meet with readers. I am very, very happy that this book is going to be getting into people's hands finally. I started it 
oh, I want to say in the summer of 17. No, summer of 16. Oh, wow. So it's been a long haul. And so this part of why I'm liking the book I'm writing now is like three guys in a tracker in the woods. <laughs> <Boom. After Yeah, laughs> <exactly. four. laughs> you know? In this book, I've got dozens and dozens of named characters mm-hmm. that matter. Uh, uh, a, a guy who's around for one week in Brenda's life has got a personality and a way of speaking and a, a past and a future. So many people like that. All this, a bunch of the boys in the barracks with Charlie. There's so many characters in this one of many reasons it was complicated. So yeah, I think now it's time. It's time. And I I hope that the love really pulls people through. Oh, I think it will. And I do, I was going to say the very same thing about people being much more comfortable with Zoom and understanding Mm -hmm. that this is going to be what we're doing for a while. So for that, I think August probably helps more than May. You know, puts people in a different position. We're going to know a lot. We? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you yeah. have a very loyal following too. I remember I, I read The Baker's Secret and absolutely loved it. It was one of my favorites that year. Thank you. But I remember I heard about it from so many people. And then that's how I knew this one was coming because you, you have a definitely a band of loyal followers. So I don't think you're going to have any problems. You know, it's such a, it's such a, uh, it's such a mutual affection. Like I said, I, the, one of the reasons I love touring is because of the people who are there and how generous they've been. I've been 20 years in newspapers and somebody hates you every day, <laughs> yeah. you know? All right. and so, so, <laughs> so when you write fiction, it's a different relationship with a reader and it's much sweeter. And uh, I really, I'm, I'm addicted to it now. I love it. Well, I'm going to ask you my last question. And that is uh, share some re- books you have read recently that you really liked. Okay, well, I'm at a point right now where I'm not doing research reading, so things I'm actually reading for pleasure. I really liked The Red Lotus by Chris Bojelian. It's a thriller, and but but unlike most thrillers, it's not formulaic, and it's interesting right from the first page. And the big surprise in it is not that good wins and evil doesn't, but rather it it gets very touching and very tender at the end, and it almost. There are moments in it that are almost like that plane over Pennsylvania where they knew they were going to try and take the hijackers down and people were calling and leaving those messages. It's like that level of poignancy, um, which is a real accomplishment for Thriller. So I like that one very much. Um, I, there are two books that are coming out the same day as mine, so I should not mention them, but I'm going to because <laughs> I got advanced copies of them both. One is The Lions of New York. Uh, by Fiona Davis, right? Love and, that one. Yes, and the lions are the lions in front of the New York Public Library, and that is where I go write. You know, I'm often in New York. My sons are there, and my editor and agent and so on, and many friends and family, and so I'm often there, and I go work in the Rose Room at the New York Public Library, and I have one of my favorite pictures of myself is standing with one of the lions outside. So I was very drawn to it, and it's a really interesting book because in a way, it's kind of a historical book. It's a love letter to books, and it also is written like a mystery, like Every chapter has an incredible hook, and it's definitely like a book that makes you stay up late. And then the other one is this one by my friend Karen Levitt, With or Without You. This is about a woman who falls into a coma, and she's in it for months. And when she emerges, how she is changed and how their lives redirect. And there are ways it's very sad, and there are ways it's lovely, and it's incredibly clean. Like, she will put something in that's something they argue about on page 100, and it turns out to be essential on page 300, and it solves a problem. It's like, I was thinking about it this morning, it's sort of like if you watch the magician put the rabbit inside the hat, you would still be amazed when he pulled the rabbit up. Right. How she does it, and I actually want to go back and look through it again because it's so skillfully done. And so before we wrap up, uh, you're going to read a little bit from Universe of Two. Oh, yes, yes, I'd love to. Um, I'm going to read for about 45 minutes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> So, so everybody read, sit down and get comfortable. Exactly. <laughs> refresh that coffee. No, I'm going, to read, I'm going to read less than one page, okay? But it's just to give people a sense of the structure of this book and the voice and so on. So no preamble. We're just in. If you open the book, this is what you get. Chapter one. I met Charlie Fish in Chicago in the fall of 1943. First, I dismissed him. Then I liked him. Then I ruined him. Then I saved him. In return, he taught me what love was, lust too, and above all, what it is like to have a powerful conscience. On first impression, Charlie was weak-chinned. To my girlfriends, I might have called him a milk toast, soft as an old banana. 
which only goes to show how smart a 19-year-old girl is about anything. Now I know better. It turns out the greatest kinds of strength are hidden and move slowly and cannot be stopped by anything until they have changed the world, which he did twice. I'm not exaggerating. I was there on both occasions. One time I helped him and the other time I hurt him. I hadn't intended any harm, but there's no denying that I used my influence to make him do terrible things, irreversible things. He forgave me. That was in his nature, but I haven't forgiven myself even now, all these many years later. Some deeds are like tattoos and the ink of regret is permanent. How did it start? As innocently as the chiming of a bell when a shop door opens. I was in the back office when I heard it ring, letting me know a customer had come in. Now I want to start all over again. I love the book so much. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to go pick it up and reread it right now. <laughs> the whole plot is in that second sentence, you know? It really <laughs> is. I mean, like really right Saban, the book. <laughs> well, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. I just really, no really enjoyed talking about University of Two, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. I hope that, that it helps uh, University of Two find lots of readers, and I enjoyed speaking with you, too. Thanks so much. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, Please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and review it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would greatly appreciate it. Stephen's book can be purchased at Murder by the Book, where I work part time, and the link is in the show notes. Thanks to KP Regan for the sound editing, and as always, thank you so much for listening. Coming up on Five Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily.